Howdy folks, welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. As usual, I start off by talking about things that aren't World of Tanks and War Thunder. Elite Dangerous, this week's newsletter, as introducing the concept of, well, these things here, outposts. Outposts are tiny little, well, space stations that aren't big enough to really deserve the title of space station, stuck out in the arse end of nowhere in all of these backwater star systems. Tiny little places that can't afford big, expensive federal security services. So just because you had a nice warm reception the last time you visited one of these little outposts doesn't necessarily mean that the same people are going to be in control of it the next time you visit. They're also going to have very, very limited docking facilities. Some of them might be too small to actually accommodate your ship. Some of them might already have somebody parked there. <laughs> Well, I can think of ways of getting them to move their ship, but not all of them are strictly legal. Actually, speaking of which, I've noticed a trend lately. Every time I put up a Star Citizen or Elite Dangerous gameplay video, there's always some humorous dick in the comments complaining that, oh, this isn't realistic at all, I can hear the sounds. Right, because that's what's not realistic about faster than light travel and starfighters, isn't it? And popular culture is just littered with examples of all this sort of stuff that you just can't take seriously, because you can hear it. Oh, come on, be serious. How can I hear the lasers? And the explosions, and the sounds of the engines. I mean, I can't believe this ever really happened. While we're on the subject, why is the London Symphony Orchestra in space? Aside from the fact that we can hear them, do you have any idea how expensive it is to actually put mass into orbit? I mean, are we seriously expected to believe that any kind of competent military organisation is going to waste that much lift capacity just to put a bunch of tubers and violins into orbit? I really don't think so. Here, this is how it should be. So much more realistic now. Close as you can, and engage those Star Destroyers at point-blank range. At that close range, we won't last long against those Star Destroyers. We'll last longer than we will against that Death Star. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, hang on, hang on. I heard a sound effect. Oh, no, that's all right. He was inside the ship. Yeah, we'll let him have that one as well. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sold. I mean, this is totally convincing now. Watch out, squad at point oh six. I'm on it, gold leader. And so much more atmospheric and exciting. The shield is down. Commence attack on the Death Star's main reactor. <laughs> Told you they'd do it. <laughs> Remember, in space, nobody can hear the sound of your plasma guns and turbo lasers. Or your ion engines. Actually, Jingles, the ion engine is a real concept that has been... Oh, fuck off. Here goes nothing. But, but, how can they expect us to treat this as a real simulation of the... Uh, uh, but they're not, are they? Star Citizen, Elite Dangerous, and Star Wars all have one thing in common. None of them are simulators. In fact, you know what? Just to piss off all you Sheldon Cooper wannabes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to turn the sound back on. No! No! It's all so unrealistic! And oh my god, what's wrong with his face? No, Jingle, stop it. Carl Sagan is turning in his grave. Oh, this is awful. Look at this. Oh no, they're all moving with no respect for the laws of physics. Right, that's it. You've pushed me too far. I am writing a sternly worded letter of complaint to Neil deGrasse Tyson. You've had it now. Stop it, Jingles! Stop it! Stop making me have fun! No, Jingles, no! How am I ever going to impress people in the comments section of YouTube videos with my superior knowledge of physics if you won't take me seriously? To be fair, though, they do have a point. The Star Wars prequels, for example, would be immeasurably improved if they turned the sound off whenever Hayden Christensen was speaking. So, War Thunder. You know, sometimes I really, really wonder what kind of crack pipe the developers of this game are passing around back at Gaijin headquarters. That is a Yak 1B. It's crap. Right, the real thing was crap. It was a death trap. It was too heavy. 
it was underpowered, it was underarmed, it turned like a brick, it climbed like a brick. It was just a terrible, terrible aircraft. It's one of the best things the Russians had at the time, but it sucked. The current realistic battle event is escorting Sturmoviks. Um, you are recreating the Normandy Nyman French fighter squadron, which served on the Eastern Front of World War II. French pilots that flew Yakolev fighters and apparently specialised in escorting bombers and attackers. Well, OK. You have to fly the Yak-1B. It's the only choice available for the Russians. The Germans get to choose the MC-200 Series 7, MC-200 Series 3, the MC-202, the BF-110, or the BF-109F4. So naturally, everybody chooses the BF-109F4, the MC-202, and occasionally the BF-110. Why is that a problem? Well, let's just have a look. There it is, the Yak-1B. Only aircraft the Russians are allowed to use. It's garbage. It's not particularly fast. It's, you know, it's just, it's just a terrible bloody aircraft. It's underarmed, it's underpowered, it's too heavy, it can't climb, it can't turn, it's just crap. It's got one 20mm cannon though, with, let's have a look. <laughs> 120 rounds of ammunition, hooray, and one 50 caliber machine gun, and that only has 200 rounds of ammunition, and is prone to overheating and jamming. So, what does the Luftwaffe get? Well, it gets this thing, the MC-202, which is a lower battle rating than the Yak-1B. I have no idea why, because it's a superior aircraft in just about every respect. <laughs> it's faster, it climbs way better, it's more manoeuvrable. Arguably, it's more heavily armed. It has two 50 caliber machine guns and two 7.7 millimeter machine guns. It doesn't have a 20 millimeter cannon, but it's got 800 rounds of ammunition for the 50 cals and a thousand rounds of ammunition for the 7.7 mils. Okay, then of course, there's the BF 109F4, which is a full battle rating higher, and deservedly so. This thing has got two 20mm MG-151 cannons, actually it's got three, <laughs> I'm sorry, three 20mm MG-151 cannons with 250 and 200 rounds of ammunition and it's got two 7.92mm machine guns with a thousand rounds of ammunition. It's also faster and it climbs faster and oh, it's just, it's just a better aircraft. So in this event, the Russians are stuck with one complete dog of an aircraft, and the Germans get to choose from a whole range of aircraft that are superior in every way. Is it therefore any surprise whatsoever that if you try to play this event as the Russians, you end up staring results like this in the face over and over and over and over? I think not. Pass the crack pipe, please, Gaijin. I want some of what you're smoking. So, as just one example of the kind of hilarity that ensues if you are dumb enough to go within a country mile of this event in a, in a Yak-1B, um, there I am, third best on the team, in a realistic battle. Hooray! Well, you must have done very well, Jingles. No, I sucked. <laughs> I, uh, I, I lined up a perfect attack run on a BF-110 when his attention was distracted, critted one of his engines, and then all my guns jammed. <laughs> And I had to leave him and fly back to base, where I got pounced on the runway by a BF-109. Not one, I don't know what's going on with my air, with my runways, anti-aircraft guns, none of them opened up on this BF-109, and he just killed me on the runway. So, yeah. So I got an assist. Eventually the BF-110 fell out of the sky, and hey, Jingle's got an assist. That's it. That's it. That's the third best anybody on my team could do. And that is not unusual. This is not an extreme example. <laughs> That's what the results screen looks like for the Russian side in this event. Note also the fact that the Russians not only have to fly infinitely inferior aircraft, they also have to fly less of them. <laughs> the Germans outnumber them every time because the Russians get some AI IL-2s to escort. Oh, well, that makes all the difference. <laughs> uh, seriously, it's fake laughing. Only the tears are real. But hey, don't take my word for it. I'm just a scrub who doesn't know anything about aircraft. Let's see what the community thinks. Let's see them voting with their feet. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> there are nine people queuing up as the Russians across all four servers, and there are, oh my god, 17, 24, 35, 36 people queuing up as the Germans. 30, oh no, there's more, there's more. Oh, there's a whole bunch of other people just jumped into rank one aircraft. There's about 40, 50 people queuing up <laughs> as the Germans, and uh, roughly 80% of them are in all the rank three aircraft. Gee, who saw that one coming? Oh, that's right, I did. And I don't design computer games for a living. It's as if, is it just me? It must be just me. Oh, fuck that. No, I'm not actually playing this again. But the fun and games doesn't end there. I tried the Guadalcanal event as the Japanese, although I should have been suspicious that so many people were complaining in chat about packet loss and lag. Yep. You know, you'd think instead of sitting on all those piles of cash that they're making hand over fist from selling premium aircraft and tank packs, they'd do something about upgrading their servers, but no, it was not to be. So, you know, I thought I'd, I'd risk the shitty servers and have another go. This time was the British. I'm in a Hawker Hurricane. That is an H6K. Four-engined, flying boat. And he is dogfighting me. This is in what is laughingly referred to as realistic battle mode. <laughs> right now, I'm just staring in sheer disbelief uh, this guy who is out turning, out climbing, and out maneuvering my fighter in a flying boat. What's this? I turn on him. He's not afraid of me, he's actually going for me. I turn in. And within a matter of seconds, he's already a kilometre above me. <laughs> Alright, last resort. Ground forces. Realistic battle. I tried going for simulator battle, but I'm playing War Thunder, not Q Thunder, so... Sim uh, realistic battle, it is. I'm in the SU-152. There's a target. There he is. Got a perfect view of the corner there. If that guy just backs up... Bingo! So, good start. He's not the only one on that corner, however. There we go, there's a Panzer 4H up there too. Uh, and rather than backing up, they know I'm here. Instead, there's some rocks up in front I can use as cover. Bounce one hit. Gun's almost re-aimed. There we go. Nothing visible on the corner. And it's around about now when an invisible tiger, invisible because he's on the other side of the rock on the far side of the road, fires through the corner and through the cover that I'm hiding behind and uh, detonates my ammo rack. So I really have been trying to bring you some War Thunder content, but for some bizarre reason I just really don't seem to feel like playing it anymore. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying I've just rage uninstalled War Thunder or anything, but it's really... it's really testing my patience lately. Actually, speaking of War Thunder, quick update for you on the whole Sky Police situation that was mentioned in last week's Mingles with Jingles. Gaijin are stamping down on them hard. People are getting their accounts banned left, right and centre. Which is, you know, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, um, quick recap, Sky Police, War Thunder Sim Battle Community. Big problem in War Thunder Sim Battles at the moment where people who have no clue how to fly an aircraft and simulate a battle are just jumping into big, heavily armed bombers, usually B-17s. Anything with lots and lots of guns, so, you know, not an Avro Lancaster. <laughs> and, uh, and effectively letting the game fly it for them, and just farming air kills, and, and actively getting themselves into dogfights with sim pilot fighters, and letting their AI gunners shoot them down for them. It's totally within the rules of the game, and it's a really, really cheap and just douchebag way of gaming the system and farming lots and lots and lots of credits and XP. And the sim community in War Thunder is absolutely outraged about it. And a whole bunch of sim community players, specifically fighter pilot players, have taken matters into their own hands and are basically breaking the rules and team killing 
and griefing and trolling and ramming the shit out of anybody that they find flying one of these bomber gunships. Well, guys, you're not standing for it at all. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that this is exactly the reaction that Gaijin are having to this, um, well, it's basically an organised player revolt. But the players are revolting in a way that breaks the terms of service of the game. The guys who are taking advantage of the situation and flying the bomber gunships are not. So it's very, very easy for Gaijin to come down hard on the Sky Police because they're doing something wrong that they can get their accounts banned over, and that's exactly what Gaijin are doing it's very, very difficult for Gaijin to do something about the guys flying the bomber gunships because that means they have to rewrite the game. So it's not a good time to be a member of the Sky Police in the War Thunder Sim community. And it's a funny old situation because while I do sympathise with, um, well, we'll call them the Sky Police, that's the name they've picked for themselves, I certainly do sympathise with them. Um, the problem that they're trying to fight is a very real problem and it's game-breaking. However, um, I can't condone the methods that they're using to address the problem because basically they're being arseholes. <laughs> no two ways about it. They're basically being douchebags in order to address a problem. And the whole thing just comes back to the whole concept of accepting responsibility for your actions. And I realise this is a very old-fashioned concept, but um, I still think it has a place in the modern world. And of course, you know, this translates into multiplayer gaming as well. To give you an example, let's say you're playing War Thunder. You're in a realistic battle, you're flying your MiG-15. There's one other player left alive on your team. He is returning to base to repair and rearm his aircraft. The ticket count is running down, you're out of ammunition. You spot the last enemy player, he's flying an F-86 Sabre. He's badly damaged, he's limping home. You've got no ammunition left. So you ram him. Enemy team is now out of players. You're dead as well, but you've still got one pilot left flying on your team, therefore your team wins. You just pulled a dick move. No, you did. <laughs> no, no, bear with me. You pulled a dick move. You were an asshole. Now, I'm not arguing with the reasons why you did it. Hell, thousands of people would agree that it is a tactically sound dick move. But it's still a dick move. Now, I really should lay my cards on the table here and say that I am one of the players who will just never ram anybody in, in any circumstances. Not deliberately. I'm not saying I haven't accidentally flown into other planes, but I've never done it on purpose, and I never will do it on purpose. This does not mean I'm condemning the people that do do it on purpose. In the example that I gave, it is an absolutely sound tactical decision to go for the ram in order to not lose the game. I understand that. But what I'm saying is, I understand why you're being a dick. You're still being a dick, but I understand why. And I may even agree with the reasons why you did it, but the fact remains, you're being a dick. Now, I should also point out that I am not for a second saying that I am a paragon of virtue when I'm playing multiplayer games. I pull dick moves too, I just don't ram people. But the point I'm trying to make here, and again, it all comes down to being a man and admitting the reasons why you do the things that you do and accepting the consequences of your actions. I pull dick moves in online multiplayer games. When I'm getting focused down in a game of War Thunder, when somebody at the start of the game has said, oh look, it's Jingles, Jingles, I'm going to get you. And that guy then ignores absolutely everybody else on my team just to fly after me. I will pull a dick move on him. I will lead him all the way to the edge of the map and just before he gets within shooting range I'll type a little message in chat to him, troll him a little bit and say hey does your plane do this and then I'll bail out. It's a dick move. The difference is I don't try to say it's not a dick move. If I'm gonna pull a dick move in an online multiplayer game and then put a video of it up on YouTube I'm not fooling anybody. <laughs> it's a dick move but I'm being honest about it. I'm being a dick. Now the consequences of my pulling a dick move like that and putting it up on YouTube for the world to see is that hundreds of thousands of people say Jesus Jingles, you're an arsehole and I say yes, I am and then the video gets voted down a lot those are the consequences of me being a dick and I'm perfectly happy to accept those consequences if I wasn't, I shouldn't have done it, should I? 
I've always been a proponent of the philosophy that you should be free to do whatever the hell you like, whenever the hell you like, to whoever the hell you like, as long as you're prepared to accept the consequences of your actions. You might be the kind of person who loves nothing more than running up to complete strangers in the middle of the street and slapping them in the face with a custard pie. And, you know, if that's what you enjoy doing, then you go ahead and do that. But the consequences of those actions are you're going to get punched in the face a lot. As long as you're perfectly happy with getting punched in the face, then by all means, go out there and sling custard pies in the faces of complete strangers. All I ask is that when you do pie somebody in the face and they turn around and say, what the hell did you do that for? You say, well, just for the sheer joy of slapping you in the face with a custard pie. And then accept your punch in the nose with good grace. Don't try to say, oh, I thought your face was on fire and, uh, and, and I've got this cup full of uh, fire retardant foam and you're not falling for it, are you? No, okay. See, that's what really pisses me off. Dishonesty about your motives. And that's really what it all boils down to. If I'm ever about to pull a dick move in a video, you'll know about it because I'll tell you in advance when it's going to happen. If I'm in a game of World of Tanks and I'm chasing somebody else down on my team for the last kill of the last remaining enemy tank who's sitting in the cap circle, for example, and you suddenly see me swerve in front of the other friendly tank, blocking his shot so that I can claim the kill and maybe get a top gun out of it, you'll know it's a dick move because right before it happens, I will say, and this is where I act like an asshole. One thing that you will not hear is me saying, and this is where I pulled in front of this other tank because I wanted to protect him from enemy fire because I didn't want him to die because I'm such a good guy. <laughs> Aren't I great? No. It was a dick move. And you'll know it's a dick move because I'll tell you it's a dick move. I make this promise to you now that you will never hear from me the kind of bullshit whiny apologist excuses that come from the overwhelming majority of people who regularly ram other players in War Thunder. And this is what always amuses me so much whenever the subject comes up in the comments of one of my War Thunder videos. Because you've constantly got one side saying, oh, but it happened in real life, the kamikaze pilots. Yeah, the kamikaze pilots were dicks as well. <laughs> oh, but the Sonder Commando Elder pilots also. Yeah, they were dicks too. It was a dick move when they did it. It's a dick move when you do it. And this is the point that I'm trying to make. Because you're constantly seeing people saying, oh, well, yeah, but they did it in real life. Yeah, th but you're not doing it because you're inspired by the exploits of the kamikaze pilots or the Sonder Commando Elba pilots. You're doing it because you don't want to lose, and that's why you're being a dick. And as long as you're honest about it, I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. Accepting responsibility for your actions. It's what it all comes down to. Being honest about your motives. I have absolutely no problem with somebody who says, yep, I rammed the last pilot on the enemy team because if I didn't do it, we were going to lose. Fine. That makes perfect sense. I understand why you pulled a dick move at the end of the game. It was a sound tactical reason for doing so. More importantly, I respect the fact that you're not trying to hide behind the historical accuracy lie in justifying why you did what you did. You did it because you didn't want to lose. You're not particularly proud of it, you would rather have shot the guy down, but you didn't have any ammunition. The AI was busy running down your friendly tanks, you had no way of stopping the guy from getting back to his airbase. You pulled a dick move. The consequences of you pulling that dick move were that, um, well, my respect for you went up a few notches, because you didn't try and bullshit your way out of it by saying, oh, but the kamikaze pilots did it. The guy that you rammed may have shouted at you a bit, but he may very well have completely understood why you did what you did as well. And uh, you won the game. So <laughs> no real negative consequences, are there? No real incentive for you to not do the same thing again in the same circumstances. And then, of course, we come back to the subject of the Sky Police. The consequences of their actions are a little more serious. And I just wonder whether or not they're prepared to pay the price for what they're doing. Whether or not you sympathise with their motivations, and I do sympathise with their motivations... The problem that they're experiencing doesn't affect me. I, I don't play simulator battles. So I'm just not good enough to play simulator battles. But there's a whole lot of other people who aren't good enough to play simulator battles who are playing simulator battles in AI-controlled bomber gunships. And that's the source of the problem. And I do sympathise. Um, the problem is that the sim community in War Thunder is such a small percentage of the overall number of people playing. 
I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's less than 5% of the people who play War Thunder on a regular basis actually take part actively in sim battles. And so they don't really have much clout when it comes to complaining about what's going on in sim battles. As far as Gaijin are concerned, um, Gaijin are far more concerned about the far bigger number of paying customers who play arcade and realistic. And this is what's forced the Sky Police to take matters into their own hands. But make no mistake about it, what the Sky Police are doing is being arseholes. But they were also being arseholes about it in... Well, I'm tempted to say an incredibly stupid way, because they were broadcasting their manifesto, if you like, on War Thunder's own forums. <laughs> so there was no way that what they were doing was not going to come to the attention of Gaijin. But at the same time, I think that that was kind of part of the point, that there's not a lot of point in <laughs> protesting something that's happened in a game that you love if you don't bring it to the developer's attention. So it was almost inevitable that Gaijin were going to crack down hard on them. And I just hope that while I'd certainly sympathise with the reasons why these guys are being arseholes, to bomber gunship pilots in sim battles, the fact nevertheless remains that they are being arseholes and Gaijin cannot tolerate it and they have to realise that this was going to happen. I suspect that there's a fair percentage of these guys who are entirely happy with uh, the way things have turned out. They, they almost certainly didn't expect an overnight solution from Gaijin but the uproar that this has caused, um, I mean it's featured on Mingles with Jingles two weeks in a row now. There's a whole bunch of people who would never have been aware of it who are now aware of the whole subject. A lot of these guys have now had their accounts banned, but a lot more people are now aware, even if they don't necessarily care, <laughs> as I suspect a lot of you don't. But you would never have heard about this whole issue if you didn't tune into Mingles with Jingles every week. So. I suspect that a lot of the Sky Police members, particularly the guys that started the whole thing off, um, are quite happy with the consequences, which is, yep, yeah, their accounts got banned. But the situation has gone from something that only a handful of people knew or even cared about to something that's been talked about by thousands and thousands of people, and something that Gaijin have been forced to take drastic and very public action over. It's not something they can just sweep under the carpet anymore. They were arseholes. They organised dick moves on a massive scale. And the consequences of that were, well, first, they got their accounts banned, and second, awareness of the issue was raised out of all proportion to the number of people that it actually affected. They're probably quite happy with that result. And if they're not happy with that result, tough shit. <laughs> you shouldn't have been arseholes, should you? So... How about we try something new this week? And this week's episode of Mingled with Jingles, we're going to try doing something that we've never done before. I'm going to actually answer some questions. <laughs> Let's run that one up the flagpole, see who salutes. See, see how it feels to actually answer some community questions just for once. First question comes from Arthur Chang, and uh, it's the kind of question that pops up nearly every week. And it's to do with win rating in World of Tanks. Arthur's basically asking, as so many of you do, do I believe win rating is an accurate method of determining a player's performance? Arthur, and everybody else who asked this question, I have three answers for you. The short answer, yes. The not so short answer, yes, most of the time. And the long answer, well, here's the thing. Win rating is a stat that can be artificially inflated. Uh, my win rating is artificially inflated. I think at the moment I'm a 58% win rating player. I I'm not actually a 58% win rating player. I'm more a 53-54% win rating player, but I only ever play World of Tanks these days on live streams. Live streams with people who are significantly better than I am. And uh, I'm kind of dragging their win rating down a little bit, and they're kind of dragging my win rating up a little bit. So, in my case, no. Win rating is not an accurate reflection of what you can expect from me as a player in a game of World of Tanks. I am not as good as my win rating would suggest. For the overwhelming majority of people who play World of Tanks, however, and I do understand that this is um, quite a, a 
a touchy subject. People who have low win ratings always tend to say no win rating doesn't matter, and people who have high win ratings have exactly the opposite opinion. Yes, win rating is important. And they're both right and they're both wrong. Win rating is an accurate judge of how well you can be expected to perform in a game of World of Tanks once you've played enough games. If you see somebody driving a tier 10 tank and they still have a 44% win rating, he's gonna suck. <laughs> no two ways about it. He is not somebody you should rely upon during the course of that game. At that stage, if you're driving a tier 10 tank and you still have a 44% win rating, you are bad at World of Tanks and you're probably not going to get any better. Sorry. Sorry if that upsets you, but sometimes the truth does hurt. On the other hand, if you're in a tier 5 match or a tier 4 match and you see that everybody on both teams has a less than 47% win rating, well, that's perfectly normal <laughs> at that kind of level. That's actually pretty average. Generally speaking, win rate is a decent estimation of how well you can expect somebody to play the higher in battle tier you go. At tier 10 and tier 9, it's a pretty solid indication of how you can usually expect somebody to perform in a game. But the lower down the tiers you go, with the less and less games that people have played, it becomes more and more irrelevant. Arthur went on to ask, uh, don't I think that instead of win rating, something like average damage caused or average XP earned would be a better way of judging somebody's performance? And again, it depends on how many games somebody has played. If somebody's doing 500 average damage per game, but they've only played 2,000 matches, and the highest tier tank they have is tier 5, that's actually pretty damn impressive. On the other hand, if somebody's only doing 500 damage per game, and they're driving tier 10 tanks, and they've got 20,000 games played, well that's significantly less impressive. Kill to death ratio is probably a much better idea. Basically, if your kill to death ratio is in the positive, i.e. you are killing more tanks than you are being killed, then you're doing well. And obviously the reverse is also equally true. If, you are, if your kill to death ratio is negative, and you are getting killed more often than you are killing other tanks, then yeah, you're not doing so well. And that applies across the board, it doesn't matter what battle tier you're playing at. You know, it becomes a relative statistic instead of an absolute statistic, the way win rating is. But I've said in the past, and I still stand by it, that outside of statistical anomalies like myself, generally speaking, the more games you have played, the more important win rating becomes for determining how well you're likely to perform in any given game of World of Tanks. And I know a lot of people don't like hearing that. And they don't like hearing that because they've played a lot of games and they still don't have a particularly good win rating. And uh, the excuse that constantly gets trotted out in order to justify it is that it's not an individual game, it's a team game. And you're not responsible for how badly your team plays. Well, here's the thing. Given a large enough statistical sample, once you've played enough games, all of those bad teams that you've had and lousy teammates get balanced out by all those good teams that you've had where you've been carried by good teammates. They all become statistically irrelevant. And the only single factor that remains that is constant throughout all of the games that you've played is you. If you've played 10,000 games of World of Tanks, the 14,000 teammates that you have had throughout those 10,000 games, and the 15,000 enemies that you've had throughout those 10,000 games, all average out. And the only variable that remains that can influence your win rate up or down is your own performance. And it's a very, very, very small influence. After all, you're only one player among 30 in any given game of World of Tanks. But given enough games of World of Tanks, it's the only significant factor in all of the games that you've played. And that's why win rating is a decent indication of how well you can be expected to play once you've played enough games. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, that it's not true. It is true, but let's just say for the sake of argument that it isn't. Let's say that your win rating 
is only influenced by the other people on your team. And for that matter, the people on the enemy team who may be significantly better than the people on your team in every single game that you've played. Statistically unlikely, though that may be, let's just say that that is in fact true. What's the point in complaining about it? There is absolutely nothing that you can do about how well or badly everybody else on your team plays. You've got no control over that. And that brings me on to the next question that I wanted to answer this week from NXLB0001. I probably won't be repeating his name <laughs> during the course of the answer to his question. And his question was, Jingles, to what extent do you think doing well or badly in a game can limit the fun and enjoyment you get out of it? Sometimes he worries himself too much about his stats and doing well, and he realises he's not enjoying the game as much as he would if he was playing just for fun and relaxing a bit more. Well, that depends entirely on why you're playing in the first place. Multiplayer games, by their nature, are competitive. Particularly games like World of Tanks, Call of Duty, Battlefield... You know, the kind of games where your objective is to beat other players as part of a team. Even cooperative games have an element of competitiveness built into them. You're not competing directly against other players, but you are competing with other players in order to be the most productive member of your team and beat the game. But generally speaking, most people do play multiplayer games in order to beat other players. And, and also because there's only so many times you can play a single player game before it gets boring. And multiplayer games, um, while well, they have the capacity to always keep surprising you, because you can never always predict the way a human opponent is going to react. Sometimes they do the most mind-bogglingly stupid things. Um, and sometimes they do the most ridiculously clever things. And that's not something that you can really code into AI. And that's why multiplayer gaming is so popular. There's only so much satisfaction you can get out of advancing to the next AI spawn point in a single-player level of Call of Duty, for example. But outwitting and beating another person is so much more satisfying. Of course, not everybody's good at it. Some people are just naturally good at it. Um, some people are not naturally good at it, but can teach themselves to be good at it, and some people are just hopeless <laughs> and are never going to get any better. That doesn't mean they can't have fun doing it, but it probably means that winning is not one of their great motivational factors. Of course, most people playing multiplayer games do care about winning or losing. That's why they're playing multiplayer games. They want to beat other people. And that's bad news if you play World of Tanks, because even if you're a complete Joe average player, you're going to lose more games than you win. How can you say that, Jingles? Well, there's not just a winning team and a losing team in World of Tanks. Sometimes you get a draw. Draws account for anything between 1 and 2% of all matches played, and in a draw, everybody's a loser. <laughs> so, even for the most Joe average of World of Tanks players, you're still going to lose more games than you win. And yet, somehow, you still see players who have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 games played, and they've got 55%, 57%, 60% win ratings. How can this be possible? Are they not getting the same teams that you are? Well, yeah, of course they are. But the only thing that's different is them. So, if you do care about winning and losing, and, and most people playing these games do care about winning and losing. It's why they play in the first place. If you do care about winning and losing, and your enjoyment of the game rests on how well you do out of it, you have to stop blaming your team for your win rate. And I say that for two reasons. Um, the first is the obvious statistical reason. And it goes back to the previous question. Over a big enough sample of games, Personal skill is the only thing that makes a difference. Blaming your team is not something that you can keep on doing and expect to get any better at the game. There is absolutely nothing that you can do about how badly or well your team or the enemy team plays. The only thing that you have any control over is how well you play. When you're playing World of Tanks, leaving 
draws out the equation for the moment. You're either going to win the game or you're going to lose the game. If you lose the game, it's very, very easy to fall into the trap of looking for excuses. Lag, crappy matchmaker, shit team, lemming train, well up the north flank, whatever. If you keep doing that, you're never going to get any better. You're never going to get any better because you keep dismissing the loss on your team rather than looking at what you could do to improve your game. You can't do anything about how badly your team did. The only thing you have any control over is your own performance. Look at it on the flip side. What do you blame it on when your team wins and you still had a shitty game? You can't blame your team anymore. <laughs> they won, and they won despite your shitty performance. At some point, you've got to start analysing what it is that you can do that's actually going to improve your chances of winning a game. And the only thing you can do to improve your chances of winning a game is to get better at playing World of Tanks, or War Thunder, or Call of Duty, or whatever it is that you're doing. Even if your team was hopeless, and a lot of the time your team is hopeless, um, complaining about it is a complete waste of effort. It, it serves no useful purpose whatsoever. All it does is get you angry, put you in the wrong frame of mind for your next match, and it doesn't make the next team that you have any magically better than the last team that you had, just because you had a good rage about it before you pressed the next battle button. I get mad when I play World of Tanks, but I get mad at myself. I, I rage at the dumb shit that I do. I mean, I rage at the dumb shit that my team does as well, but there's nothing I can do about that. All I can do is make sure I try not to repeat the same stupid mistakes that I made, and that's the only way I or anybody am ever going to get better at it. But the first step consists of acknowledging that it, you are the one who needs to get better. Your team isn't going to get any better just because you want them to. Stop wishing for it and stop getting angry about it because you're only going to give yourself an ulcer. Set yourself some practical goals. Have a look at your average damage and average experience earned per battle and tell yourself that the next time you hit that random battle button you're going to do better. And if you don't, have a look at why you didn't do better. Have a look at your own replays. A lot of the time in the heat of the action, what you think happened isn't actually what happened at all. And it's only watching the replays afterwards that you think, oh, actually, yeah, he, he, he didn't pull that dick move. That was actually my fault. Oops. <laughs> Perhaps I should send him a PM and apologise. Um, seriously, judge your own performance, not your team's. You can't do anything about your team's performance. Your own performance is the only thing that you have any control over whatsoever. And the sooner everybody realises that and starts taking steps to improve their own performance, well, I'm not saying that you're going to turn into a unicum overnight. Um, I'm certainly not. I think I've reached the plateau of my own skill level in World of Tanks. Although, there's still things that I could and should be doing to get better. So, there is, there's, there's always room for improvement. And that's what the best players keep telling themselves. If you ever watch Quickie Baby when he's playing, any time... Things don't work out the way that he expected or hoped they might. He always, on his live stream, stops and explains to his audience and analyzes his own performance and says, right, this is what I did, this is what I should have done. There's always room for improvement. Even the players with the very, very best win ratings will be the first to acknowledge that. And that's why they're the players with the best win ratings. Of course, if you don't actually care about winning or losing in the first place, then I'm, I have to ask, what the hell are you doing playing online multiplayer games in the first place, you strange person? Anyway, that's it for this week's Mingles with Jingles, and it's been another mammoth episode, 44 minutes. Oh, I am so good to you people. I hope you didn't have anything important planned. <laughs> do people actually watch Mingles with Jingles in one continuous sitting, or do you split it up into chunks and watch bits of it throughout the course of the week? Just curious. Anyway, that's it for this week. Take care, folks. Catch you next time. And whatever you're playing, have fun playing it.